When I'm asked what I do for a living, I usually answer, well, I help people use their brain better. So people usually giggle and go like, oh yeah, I could use some of that. And then the questions start. Um, you know, things like, well, how can I know if I use my right brain or left brain more? I go like, yeah, well, sorry to tell you, you don't use your right brain more or left brain more. That's, that's one of those neuromyths. Uh, then I've got questions like, okay, um, in evolution, our brain is only getting bitter, bigger and bigger, right? And uh, in a couple of generations, we'll all walk around like uh, aliens with these huge heads. Uh, no, that's not going to happen because actually evolution, over the last 10,000 years, our, our brain has uh, become smaller. We've lost like some 10% over the last 10,000 years. And if you go to, even before that, you go to Neanderthal, you see that our brain, yeah, we're the left guy. <laughs> uh, our brain has, has shrunk. So, um, so no, that's not true either. Another one. Um, is it true that left-handed people are more creative? Any left-handed people in the room? Yeah? I love it when left-handed people raise their right hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, not true either. That's, that's not one thing. We're just right or left brain, we're, uh, we, we use our brain differently, and, but it's not more, better, or whatever. So, one more. Oh, the big one. Is it true that we only use 10% of our brain? Right? So, I have to get this straight. Our brain is the most complex biological structure in the known universe. And then somehow we go like, nah, I only use 10% of that. It just doesn't make sense, right? So, where does that come from? Well, it has to do with uh, Jung and Freud. They gave us the iceberg analogy. So, you know, the top of the iceberg is the part we're conscious of. And the part below the surface is the part we're not conscious of. And, um, well, scientists themselves don't agree how much we're conscious of, of what's happening in the brain, and how much we're non-conscious of. Uh, the optimistic ones I found speak about 5%, only 5%. And the pessimistic ones speak about 0 0.0005%. Yeah, that's sobering, right? <laughs> We're only conscious of anywhere between 5 and 0.0005%. So what's happening in that brain of ours that we're so little aware of? Well, the first thing is, when you look at me here in front of you, I know it's not a special feat just standing here, but the fact of standing here is already, from a processing power in our brain, is already really uh, advanced stuff. Just ask any nine-month-old baby, and they will tell you that, uh, well, it's not as easy as it looks. Um, or even better, ask an engineer, any engineer who's trying to build a robot, uh, like that, that, that balance thing is really hard to, uh, to, to get. Right now, they, um, they got robots on four legs that can jump around and, and, and walk more or less good. I mean, more than more or less. It's pretty impressive stuff they're doing. However, two legs is still a bridge too far. So what else is happening there? Um, our brain regulates our body. So uh, we're talking our heart, right? Our heart is beating. Uh, we've got our whole digestive system uh, functioning. Imagine how it would be like uh, we had lunch a little earlier, so if you would go like, hmm, I still need some more gastric juices in there because it's not quite done yet, wouldn't be, yeah, wouldn't make sense. Breathing, breathing is one thing we do, we're not conscious of, however, I can make you conscious of. So right now, if you're all realized, I'm talking about your breathing, and you're like, oh yeah, right, I can breathe, you can control your breathing. But the funny thing is, within the 10 seconds that I stop talking about breathing, it will become non-conscious again. So what about, um, oh, a big part of our brain is also dealing with our senses, the information coming in from our senses. Obviously, our eyes is uh, very dominant, but there are all kinds of other stuff that's happening below the surface we're not conscious of, so our brain ne needs to regulate that. What shall we pay attention to and what shall we not? And uh, I can make you pay attention now to, uh, for example, your seat and how it's touching your back, or your feet touching your shoes, right? It can bubble up to consciousness. But of course, 
you're talking about thoughts and memory, right? That's, that's the whole thing that interests us. So what about that part? Well, let me break another myth on that one. Um, we are, there, there's no such thing as a magic pill that you can take and that you can magically remember everything that happened in your childhood and even when you were in your mother's womb. It makes for fun uh, Hollywood movies, but uh, it's not reality. Because babies, toddlers, uh, their brain is not made to, 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 to remember, to have memories. It's still formatting itself, structuring itself to, to get the information, to be able to process the information during our whole life. And it will continue, that processing, how it went, will continue to influence during our whole life. It will help us uh, deal with things like authority, like adversity, like dealing with emotions. And, well, if you take, for example, raising kids, there's a funny thing happening with raising kids. So basically, you know, usually what's happening is that we, um, we raise our kids the same way we've been raised. And it is not a conscious choice. We don't go like, hmm, I had a really good education. My parents were fantastic. Well, this and that could have been better. So let me try to reproduce this with my kids. That's usually not how it's happening. Uh, our brain builds scripts, scripts about how to deal with situations. And then when we are uh, using those scripts, well, the, the easiest way to build a script is to copy paste what we've been through ourselves, what we already know, right? And then at one point, I don't know, are there parents in the room, right? So at one point as a parent, you start saying things that you've heard before, but they come out of your own mouth. You know, things like, this is not a hotel. And things like, as long as you live in my house, it's my rules. Sounds familiar? M my favorite one is, I'm doing this for your own good. And then somehow you realize that you morphed into a version of your own parents. It's a sobering experience. So that's happening with parenting, but sometimes it's the opposite that's happening. You just realize that how, the effect of, uh, of how you were raised, and, and you consciously decide to, to push back and to go like, no, I don't want that for my kids. I want a different education for my kids. That's when things become interesting. That's when non-conscious patterns, scripts, come to the surface, become conscious, and we can actively decide to change that. And that's when the empowerment starts. I love this, this quote from Carl Jung. It says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So whenever there's something happening in your life that comes back regularly, right? You can go like, oh, it's always happening to me. I'm so unlucky. This is karma. Well, think of Carl Jung, right? Knowledge is power. And that is the real reason why I'm so totally fascinated by the brain. It empowers people. So it empowers people, and yet we are all sabotaging ourselves all the time, mostly. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Let's take, uh, let's take sleep. So on average, an adult uh, sleeps eight hours uh, at night. Some people sleep more, some people sleep less, sure. Now here in this room, how many of you sleep on average less than seven hours at night? By raise of hands. You see, it's always this happening when I ask this question. There's almost half of the people raising their hands. Now you have to understand that sleeping less than seven hours at night is seen as sleep deprivation. Um, and that's not good. Let me uh, try to explain what's happening in our brain when we sleep. You see, there is a lot going on there. Actually, at some points in our sleep, our brain is more active than during the day. So, just two things I want to touch on here is that, for example, um, everything we've been through during the day, the experiences we've had, uh, the, the things we learned, go from our short-term memory into our long-term memory. That happens at night. And um, another thing that's happening in the brain, well, that happens in the, the, the hippocampus. So, another thing that's happening is in that hippocampus, well, no, in general, it, there are maintenance tasks, maintenance tasks going on all the time at night uh, during that sleep of ours. And if we don't go through those seven hours of sleep, the maintenance task doesn't get done. 
and that brain becomes buggy. If we don't sleep enough, we end up, well, the, the, the signs are there immediately, right? The next day we're grumpy, we, we might have issues focusing, we might have problems with a memory, and, um, and then when you look at it, well, uh, when you look at it from a longer perspective, actually the build of a beta amyloid plaque, without wanting to get too technical here, but the build up of uh, the, the fact that the maintenance doesn't work as it should leads on the long term to Alzheimer. So that's not good news. And when you realize that, when you know that, you realize that sleep is is really important. If we sleep one third of our life, it's not just as a waste of time, it's because it's critical for a healthy brain. Now, also to know is that only humans uh, voluntarily cut down on sleep. In the animal kingdom, we're the only ones who do that on purpose. And actually, it's something like a social cool thing to, to do. Well, think again, it's not that cool, especially in the long run. Uh, scientists say the shorter our sleep, the shorter our life. Okay, I will stop scaring you now. Let's talk about movement. Who here exercises at least three times a week? Okay, nice, good for you, great. So, there is this interesting theory about uh, the brain, the origin of our brain, that um, brains developed to coordinate movement. And when you think of it, plants and trees and flowers, they don't really have a brain. Oh, they, they don't. So, uh, and animals, any animal, even if it starts wiggling just a little, it has some kind of a, a beginning of a nervous system. So, uh, it does make sense. And even if we look at our own brain, you get the cerebellum, which is a really old part. When I say old, I mean evolutionary, from an evolutionary point of view, a very old part of the brain. And the cerebellum, it's there. And what does it do? Well, it coordinates movement. So, it makes sense. And yet... Most of us end up working all day behind a computer or, or at a desk. When we get home at night, we sit down in the sofa, we watch some telly, or we surf a little more on the net. So, um, yeah, that's not helpful for the health of that brain either. One more. Last time you learned something new, but I mean really learned something new. When was that? I'm talking learning new language. I'm talking uh, learning a new music instrument, something like that, you know? One of my favorite quotes about the brain is, the brain awakens in the new. And it's not only about learning, it's about experiencing new things, trying out new things, getting out of our comfort zone. Because um, there is this thing uh, happening in our brain which is called synaptic pruning. And synaptic pruning, basically at night, again, you've got um, the maintenance task, one of the maintenance tasks is to cut off the, the, the connections that we're not using. It's a, Scientists call it the use it or lose it principle. So when we do the things we do every day the same way, we see the same people, we have the same type of conversations, we're always doing the same things, well, our brain starts to shrink, physically shrink. It will never get as bad as this, <laughs> but it will lose a couple of percentage points. Okay, next. Who here lives in an urban area? In 2008, the first time, um, it was the first time that humanity, uh, that 50% of humanity lived in urban areas. By 2050, 70% of population is uh, expected to live in urban areas, and yet uh, our brain developed with nature everywhere. So it feels at home in, na in, uh, in nature, it thrives in nature. And again, you do realize that most of uh, our artificial environments are, are sterile. Uh, they're, it's like a sensory wasteland. And, well, yeah, one-colored walls or white walls are, are the majority of environments we, we are confronted with. Interesting things is that students show, um, studies show as well that students with outside views, they perform better at standard academic, uh, academ I'll get there. <laughs> uh, well, tests. There you go. That's easy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> if you put trees along highways, you get lower aggression in traffic. And um, people living close to, uh, to the forest have a healthier amygdala. 
What is the amygdala all about? Well, it's actually the center for fear and aggression in our brain. Um, yeah. Okay, I've got one coming up that you'll probably be interested in. What about alcohol? Who here drinks alcohol from time to time? Duh. Right? Now, I've got good and bad news for you guys. The good news is alcohol, contrary to what you might think, does not kill brain cells. <laughs> now, before you all go binge drinking, <laughs> please do realize that uh, it does some other things, and uh, especially, the, I'm all, only talking about the brain, right? I'm not talking about the liver. And um, it, there's also a thing called neurogenesis you should be uh, aware of. Neurogenesis is the creation of new brain cells, and when we create new brain cells, um, well, when we drink alcohol, it pretty much reduces to zero the creation of new brain cells. So that's really not a good thing to have. But there is hope. There is light at the end of the tunnel. And there is actually one alcohol that if we drink, um, has this product in it, resveratrol, that will stimulate uh, new neurons and or this, this neurogenesis. And so the alcohol will bring it down and this resveratrol will bring it up. So, well, I didn't say this alcohol is good for your brain, but it's let's say, brain neutral, right? Any idea what that might be? Oh, I have a, an audience that already knew this one. Absolutely, it is red wine. The thing with red wine is that this resveratrol is in the skin of grapes. And uh, in the processing of red wine, the skin, uh, they leave the skin long enough for the resveratrol to enter the, um, the drink. That's also why white wine doesn't work. I'm sorry for the white wine lovers here. But back to neurogenesis. So the creation of new neurons um, and new brain cells in general, regardless of age, we create new brain cells. And um, it's, uh, when we have a high neurogenesis, it correlates with things like um, with, with more energy, feeling optimistic, uh, optimistic, filled with energy and lust for life, right? Um, low neurogenesis, unfortunately, it, it's, it's correlated with depression and anxiety and just feeling, feeling low energy like that. So what can we do? I have for you five recommendations you can do that if you do them, they will stimulate your brain. But if you don't, they will actually lower that neurogenesis. It's from this neurogenesis point of view. And I brought them down to, for you to easily remember into five letters. L-M-N-O-P. LMNOP, if you remember that, you know the keys to a higher neurogenesis, to a healthier brain. So the L stands for love. So you see, love or social connections. We are social beings and this capacity we have to communicate has become a need to communicate. If we want to feel good, we, we need to, have, to be in contact with others, but it only works with people we trust, people we care, and people we, we want to be with. So family, friends, or colleagues, if you get along with them. But the opposite is true as well. Uh, if you have a bully around you, if, if you have all the time naysayers, people who criticize you, it will lower your neurogenesis. Next one is movement, LM. M stands for movement. Now, studies show that already half an hour walking a day is already helpful for that brain of yours. Um, but I'm talking real walking, right? No window shopping here, okay? <laughs> Good. L-M-N. The N stands for novelty. Remember what I said. Novelty, right? The brain awakens in the new. There's no need for bungee jumping or jumping out of airplanes. Actually, just getting out of your comfort zone regularly uh, will help you stimulate that brain of yours. L-M-N-O. The O stands for omega-3. Omega-3 is... Um, our brain consists of, of fats, basically, and uh, the highest quality fat is omega-3. Now, we don't produce omega-3 ourselves. Um, our body doesn't do that, so we need to, t to get it out of our food. So where do we get that? Out of things like fatty fish, um, you've got nuts and seeds. By the way, I love the walnuts. They actually do look like a brain, you know that? That's my favorite. So, and the P, the last one, last but not least, is for pauses. We need to take pauses regularly, and so take a break. During the day, at the evening, the, the weekends, the holidays, they're vital for a good functioning break, brain. And the most important break of all is the daily one, is our sleep, right? <laughs> so LMNOP, we're talking love, movement, novelty, omega-3, and pauses. Take care of your brain, and it will take care of you.
Thank you. Thank you.